Um, so let's see. Test, test. Okay. So um, Robert hasn't been here for a while. Uh, let's ro welcome Robert th uh, on this Memorial Day weekend. Good morning, everyone. It's always, always good to be here. We are going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 2, just a few verses. The title of today's message is Beauty in the Beginnings, and the question that we're going to ponder is, where, where did I come from? So let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 12. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you, have, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. In verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for your holy and precious word that was preserved, was preserved for us. Thank you for your spirit that dwells in us, that allows us to discern it. Help us this morning, Lord, to see the beauties in the beginning of our creation that came from your hand, that you breathe life into us, Lord, and there's beautiful things for us to behold. May that be true today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at our, our text from this morning, it really, it's kind of with the end in mind. So I want you to kind of think of that. We were brought near by the blood of Christ. We moved from foreigners and strangers to members of God's household. That's kind of the end in mind, because there's two important quests, I think, in our life. And those two important quests are to know who you are. It's kind of the title of today's message, Beauty in the Beginnings, to know who you are. But it's also important to know whose you are, to know who you are and to know whose you are. So I'd like to look at God's word as we kind of go on that journey together today. You see, the question we, we ponder at, at a very young age, and parents get it from their children pretty quickly, and we, we kind of dread it. It's something like this, Mommy, Daddy, where did I come from? And on the heels of that is the big question, how are babies made? I'll leave that for you to discuss at home in, in the privacy of our own homes. But curiosity about where we come from and the beauty in our beginnings begins at a very early age. But as we get older, it's less about the technical process and it's more about the quest to discover who we are in relation to this world. We, you know, we know this even by looking at the world and, and mass media because Hollywood knows we love this so much. They are constantly making movies and documentaries about the backstory and origins of characters. And we love to watch documentaries about how things are made. And, and so there's a natural curiosity in discovering the beautiful things about how we came to be and who we really are. I think it's natural that we long to discover that. But one of the mistakes that we often make is we never quite go back far enough. To think about who we are, we, we might think about our family history. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not going back far enough. Uh, we, we might, in this day and age, uh, do a DNA testing, and it gets sent off, and data gets back to us, and all of a sudden, we're a percentage here, percentage there, a mixture of this and that, and we're like, okay, I've got more data, and I, I'm starting to discover perhaps who I am. But if you really want to learn the good stuff, the beautiful things in our beginning, we have to go all the way back, all the way back to the beginning. And, and that's what I think we get in, the, in Genesis. It's a picture of God creating humans into existence. And it's a, it's a picture of God creating something very, very precious to him. And, and I think the imagery to me is like that master woodworker who is, is getting ready to create something that's in his mind. And, and it's there, the vision is there, knowing exactly what he wants to make. And then he, he lays out all the tools and the display case is already ready and the workbench is all set up. Everything's ready before he begins to create what's in his mind. And I think the book of Genesis is, is like that, right? It's, it's like a mother and father getting the nursery ready for the arrival of the baby. 
the, everything's painted and the crib is there and the pillows and the mobile is, is put in place and stencils on the wall, all, everything's in place. But you know, all of that is, is kind of just silly fodder because nothing in that room is special until the child arrives. That's the crown jewel. It's not all that other fluff. What makes that room special is the child. And I think that's the picture we see in the, in the book of Genesis, where we see human, humans being breathed into existence. God gets everything else in place. There is light, it was good. There was sky, there was moon, there was expanse. And God just keeps saying it was good, it was good, it was good. But it was time for God to create humans. He changed his words. He changed how he responded to that. And we're going to take a look at that at Genesis chapter 1, because instead of just saying, let me make light, he said, let us. He actually uses the word us, so there's this understanding that God, the Trinity, is there making humans into their image. And then he didn't say it was good. What did he say? He said, very good. Remember, the beauty in this initial thought is we are so precious to God so precious from the very beginning, so precious to God. When we came into God's world, into existence, I think it is, it's just like the baby coming into a nursery. God said, oh, now this is what I had. This is very, very good. Let's just take a quick look as, as we look at uh, Genesis chapter one. Then God said, let us, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over the wild animals and over all the creatures that move around along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God saw all that he was made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. God created us to be very good in his image. And I think it's easy this day and age to feel, to feel small and insignificant, but I think the beautiful thing in, in this beginning is to really understand that God had good intentions to create something special. So I'd like us to kind of go through just four beautiful things that are coming out of the beginning of God's word. These are kind of fundamental truths that are so important for us to understand how precious we are to God. And the first one is very simple. And it's this, we are here on purpose. We are here on purpose. We can never forget that. I, I know there, there are parents that sometimes say, and my, my parents told me this, well, you were kind of a surprise baby. Like, oh, okay. And, and we know what that means. Um, but my sister never let me forget it. She would tease me all the time about that. You're not supposed to be here. You're a surprise baby. You know, eventually I got a little frustrated and I said, you know, you were just normal and God just whipped something together and poof. I was so important. I wasn't even planned. And God said, you have to take him. He, the world needs him. So we had that banter of our, in our childhood. But, but I think it's important that, that you know, if you're a surprise baby, you know what? Not to God. God planned you. God planned you for the foundation of the earth, so much so that he had to force you on your parents before they even could think about it. And I hope that makes you feel good if you're a surprise baby. But I think God even wanted my sister to be here, I suppose. And, and I think I know that to be true because all we need to do is, is look at God's word and pay attention to God's heart, right? So Psalm 139, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I am here on purpose. God made me, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know them full well. We are here because of God's design and God's plan. It is so foundational, but I think sometimes we, we forget it. We're searching other things in this world, the DNA, ancestry trees, all this, but we have to go back to the beautiful thing in the beginning that we are not an accident, we are not a mistake, we are not random, we are here on purpose by God's plan and God's design. We can never forget that. So fact number one is the beautiful thing in the beginning is you are here on purpose. Fact number two is, you are known. You're not only here on purpose, but you are known by your creator, by your maker. 
Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30, a very familiar verse. God even knows the hair on your heads. They are numbered. And that's really, really important. We've all seen little babies born. And I'll, I'll be honest, when I was a teenager, I don't know, this is really embarrassing. I kind of didn't realize that babies came out whole. I thought they were still forming. A teenager thinking, oh my gosh, those, those little fingers are still tiny. They're so tiny. And then, and then the organs are, I just couldn't even, it blew my mind. But God, in his wonderful creation, created every single part of that little tiny baby, every organ, every molecule, every cell, every fingernail. And his word wanted us not to forget that because he said, I've even counted every hair on your head. Even when you lose your hair, I still know where they are. We are known intimately by our creator. Psalm 139 says, before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you, you know it completely. Every thought that we have is, is already known by God. And I think that should scare us a little bit, right? Um, because the truth of the matter is God, God isn't pleased and, and doesn't approve every detail of our life. He will never tolerate sin. He will never tolerate sin, but he already knows about it. And, and you know, we, we, he still sticks with us. He still doesn't give up on us. And God's words are, are filled with, with how much he loves us and won't give up on us and how much he loves humanity. We know John 3.16, and we know that he, he loves us and knows us personally, but we know that it's not just the sense that God just loved the world in some ambiguous, pluralistic way. He, he drills it from this, this broad sense that God so loved the world, then he drills it down that he gave us his only son, that whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Aren't you glad that God not only loves humanity so much to give Jesus to the world, but that he so much cares for us and knows us and loves us as in individuals, that when we come to him one by one, one to himself, he receives us. That's something we can never lose sight of, that he loves us individually. Zephaniah 317, really, I, I think this is my life verse, but just look at all the red that's highlighted there, and it's just nothing but personalized you statements. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The mighty warrior who saves, my God saves, and he saved me. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you in his love, meaning he won't treat your sins as they are deserve to be treated. He will rejoice over you with singing. This, this reminds me that my Lord and God knows me, knows me personally. He's mighty to save, and he saved me personally. Jesus told multiple stories, and we'll just look at a few here, multiple stories that point to how much he cares about the one or the individual. This is the story, of course, of, of the woman with coins. Uh, suppose a woman with 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she's finished it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner, one sinner who repents. I worked at a college for over 20 years. And I loved every minute of it. And I was department chair and I, I had many, many faculty under me. It was a wonderful job. I was there and I started questioning God saying, God, why, why am I here? I, I don't feel like I'm having many spiritual conversations. I wasn't having students come up to me and say, you know, Dr. Hughes, I'd, I'd like to talk about the, that Jesus you call your savior. That never happened. It usually was, do I have to come to class? Do I have to buy the book? Do I have to, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I was wrestling with God. Why, why am I at this, this institution? And then it just hit me one day. What if God called me there for 20 years for one soul? Is it worth it? And I think, it, I think the answer is, yeah, it's worth it. 20 years, one soul. We... We like to quantify things and we like to keep saying, well, that's not enough. I'm not, I'm not as good as somebody else's work or somebody else's ministry. I, I should be saving more. I wish, I wish I could, but if God called me there for one soul, praise God. 
It was 20 years well, well spent. So we, we have to kind of get out of our own head and get back to what does God see? Well, the heavens of God, the angels rejoice over one. And we should have that sort of focus that God knows us personally and cares about the one, meaning every single person in this room. Second Peter uh, chapter three reads this way. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God knows you personally. He wants you to know him. You're supposed to be here. Remember Zephaniah 317 says, he quiets you by his love. He's so patient with us. He, he holds back, doesn't treat our sins as they should be treated, which means death. He puts that penalty on the back of Jesus because he cares so much about the one we are known personally by our Lord and God. Fact number three, God wants you to know and find your place with him. He doesn't want us to aimlessly walk around not knowing who he is or where we belong with him. And I think we've all been in this situation that's on this slide. We've been in a situation where we just don't know if we belong. And some of the, the obvious ones that probably represent us in this room, I, I've started many classes and been to many different universities as a new student, and it's scary. Am I going to fit in? Am I going to hit the mark? This is a different higher level program. I don't know if I, and then you're, and you're just scared, and, and do I belong? And, and moving into a new residence or moving to a new country, how, how awkward and scary that is. Will I fit in? Will, will I be accepted? John Eldridge wrote this, this wonderful book called Sacred Heart, Sacred Romance. He wrote another book called Wild at Heart, and that's also good. But this book he wrote called Sacred Romance. And he's got this dialogue in this book that I, that I just love because I think so many of us can, can relate to this. He, he talks about when he was in the fourth grade, and he calls it the torture of fourth grade. And, you know, you're waiting in the lines. I, I doubt they even do this anymore in middle school but you're waiting in the lines for the two people to pick the teams. Remember this? The two captains and they're picking teams. And as the captains went back and forth to pick the teams, it it usually went something like this. Um, We had Smitty last time, you take Smitty. We don't want him, right? You know, the the two captains, we don't want him this time. He's, He's not a good player, he stinks, he's awful. You take him, we don't want him, back and forth. And then, you know, John, the author of this book, he said, you know, I wasn't Smitty, I wasn't that bad, but I was never argued over, we want John, we want John on our team. He kind of just faded into the woodwork and nobody ever really wanted him on the team, but he wasn't as as bad as Smitty. But, But it was kind of this hierarchy of how it played out in the fourth grade. So anytime they said, okay, let's pick teams, so many, the Smitties, the Johns, they just, you know, went into a shell because it was that torture of, I I don't belong here. I'm not wanted here. I don't fit in on this athletic contest. And if that one we can't relate to, we can maybe relate to this. He goes on and he says, this unspoken hierarchy uh, didn't just take place on the athletic field or in gym class. He said it also took place every single day in cafeteria. You'd get your food from the cafeteria, you get your tray, and now you're looking out into the expanse of all the people. And, and you're looking for where do I fit in? Where do I belong? And you walk over to one table and somebody does this, this is taken. Sorry, Eldridge, the last name of John, this is taken, find another seat. You gotta pick your head up and find something else and somebody else is saying, we, no, this is reserved for the, the soccer team. You can't sit here. And so you just can't kind of wander back and you sit alone. And he said, this kind of took place every single day. And I think the message he's trying to send is throughout our lives, each one of us, we, we understand this constant nagging feeling and these messages are constantly being replayed. Certainly as he described the torture of fourth grade. And it's a constant message that, you know, we, we will never fit in. We will never belong. But then Eldridge writes this next dialogue, and he says, on the other hand, there is this unspeakable joy of 
when you come into that cafeteria and someone is saving a place for you. And they're not just saving a place for you and quietly, they're saying this, over here, John, over here. John, I got a place for you. They're waving at you, calling you and receiving you. And for that moment, there's this sense of sweet relief and joy that someone noticed you, somebody wants you, and they've created and saved a place for you. And he said, there's the dichotomy of feelings of torture versus the exhilaration of joy and in, in fitting in. Well, as we think about this, this point that this beautiful thing about our beginnings, we have to understand that God wants you to know that you are here, you are created because he wants you and me to find our place with him. He wants that so badly. And God is holding that place for us. And guess what? He's just not holding it quietly. He's calling you by name. John, over here, I want you to come and know me through my son. I have a place for you right here. And, and it's that sweetness that, John, don't worry about it. I already know what you did last summer. It was bad, but it's okay. I'm holding the place for you. Oh, by the way, John, I know the hair is on your head. I know exactly who you are, and I want you to be with me. And this, this is so beautiful. This is what we read in Ephesians chapter 2, where, where, where God says that we were chosen, or Ephesians chapter 1, we were chosen and adopted as sons and daughters, that God, before the foundation of the world, planned for us to be holy, blameless, and set apart because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And it's that sweet message that God tells us over and over again, get to know my son and you will know me. Get to know my son and you will know me. And that's why I chose th these verses for, for the context of our, our talk today, because the, the Ephesians chapter 2, these verses were written to people who were one-time spiritual wanderers, one-time spiritual wanderers, and they were lost. They were like John going into the cafeteria. They didn't have a place, but when they found their place with Jesus, everything changed. So it says again, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. That sounds like the torture of fourth grade. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. I love that it uses brought near by something God did for us, brought near by the blood of Christ. Because again, it's, it's this notion that, that we don't just show up and hope that we're included in, in God's household. It's, it's we are invited into God's household by the host of the party who planned it all, designed it all, created it all, has a special place for us with our name on it for us to be included in his family, adopted into his family. I mean, there is no better feeling than to know that God already has chosen us to be a part of his family. All we need to do is enter through the blood of Christ. So it brings us to our fourth point. And our fourth point is, we have to remember the beautiful thing in the beginning of Genesis that holds true to this day is, from the very beginning, we were intended to live forever. We talk about, well, death is a part of life. That's how we speak. You know what? That's so false. God never intended death and life to be together. That's not true. We are wrong. Death is not a part of life. Death is a result of sin. And we did that. God's intention was that we would live with him forever and ever and ever. So even in the book of, of Genesis, it talks about that we are not temporary or insignificant. We are precious. We are precious to God. But sin did mess it up, certainly messed it up for Adam and Eve, and then it messed it up for us, and that we have no way of having eternal life by our own merits, our own deeds, by anything we do. So God made another way, and of course that was through the precious blood of Jesus. And the beautiful thing is that God did this while we were at, at odds with him, where we were enemies of him. While we were still sinners, God, Christ died for us. 
Christ died for us. What a, what a beautiful way for God to say, look, I want to tell you how much I love you. While you were in the folly of this world, in the muck and mire, I had my son die for your sins, that once you believed in him, you would have a place with me reconciled forever. We are so valuable to God that his desire for us is to be with him for eternity. When I used to take my kids to the Dollar Tree store, um, we all knew, the kids knew, I knew that these toys were gonna break in 20 minutes, right? We knew that. They, they weren't fooled, they got it, they understood. But you know what? It was a dollar worth of fun. And, and they loved to go there, pick anything out you want, and it was fun. But I want you to consider something. How precious are you to God? Well, consider the price God paid for you. Not a dollar, right? Not a dollar's worth of life. It was, you are so precious to me. I'm going to send my son to die for you. That's how precious we are to God. That's how much value we have. I know these things seem so sophomoric. We, we know every one of these points, but boy, do people in this world need to hear that today. You have value and worth in God's eyes. You have value and worth in God. You were intended to live forever, and there's only one way to do that now. It's through the, the blood of Jesus, that you are known by somebody. And that's, that's God himself knows you personally. He knows who you were. We know that knows the sins that we have committed in the past. He knows who we were before we came to him. He knows who you are, and he knows who you will become. And God loves us, loves you with a zealous, aggressive love, and he wants you to live with him forever. And that was his intention from the very beginning. All of that, all of that should give you a sense of who you are and who you belong to, because that's the point of this whole message. And at the end of the day, your beginnings, the beautiful thing in your beginnings are marked with love, eternity, adoption, being chosen, and, and joy. So that when you know Jesus, when you put your faith and hope in him, then you are a child of the one true king. That is who you are, and that is whose you are. Amen. Father, we, we love you, we praise you, and we say hallelujah. You are the one true king. We thank you, Lord, that you've chosen us. You died for us. You know us personally, and you want us to know you intimately. May we do that by following your commands, connecting our heart with yours, Lord, being on our knees in prayer, crying out to you, and creating intimate conversations with you as the Lord God above. Amen.